Assemblymember Qureshi. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Darcy, I'm just going to bring up um, issues around the A&E service in, in London. Um, isn't the ongoing all-year crisis with A&E's uh, services in London good evidence that we need pan-London leadership to get the situation under control? I, I, I think it's the same answer I gave to Ankar earlier. I think, you know, there is... To reinforce what I've just said, there's huge variations in A&E attendance in different parts of London. So there is no one-size-fits-all, and I've learned that eight years ago. We need ways. I think you, you, I gave you three reasons why that might happen to be the case. One is primary care access, the estate, opening hours is one. The second is, the, is, is engaging the public in terms of what is available to them out of hours and how could they utilize that. The bit that we can deal with at a higher level is the misaligned incentives, I think, and that is something that we could look at. For example, the, there is a tariff for a &E attendance, so in many ways you're actually, uh, you know, the cost of that is significantly greater. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about serious you know, ambulance arrival, I'm talking about the, 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 the subgroup of patients who are attending a and &E that could actually have most of their problems dealt with at a local level if they had an out-of-hour or an urgent care provision. Yeah, I, I say that. I, I, I hear what you say about the specifics, but there are some general trends. In 2013, last year, we had over 200,000 Londoners waiting over four hours uh, in A&Es uh, to, to, to get uh, a service. Uh, we had A&E pressures during the winter, which meant something like 3,500 operations cancelled and five, uh, almost 6,000 uh, ambulances waiting for three hours. It does sound to me as there's been a lot of disconnect in, 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 yeah. in, in the immediate future. And the best example I can highlight is the London Ambulance Service. Yes. Um, they, they, had, they, had to, they lost over 200 paramedics when, uh, there was, uh, when uh, patients were expected to travel more, and no mm -hmm. doubt they had to take on that demand. Um, it's not quite clear where, um, where and when they actually, where and when they fit into yep. the whole picture of London. Yet they are a very important uh, yep. service to make yep. sure people can yep. get to their A&Es. Uh, and this is at the same time as the Care Quality Commission have suggested they actually don't need to uh, enact cuts of 53 million. They actually need to take on more paramedics. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll bring Simon in yeah. to, to address that. But just before, to be fair, the inflationary increase in A&E attendance goes as far back as 2006. And it's been increasing year by year by year by year by year. So it's nothing new about that. It's not something that happened last year. I think the only thing that I will read into that is we should have done something about this mm. for the last eight years. We wouldn't be here and uh, talking about this subject. And I, I absolutely agree and support that. So, Simon. Um, so, a couple of points. I, I think the first is just to return to something in the longer term, because we tend to focus on A&E because it's right in front of us yeah. and it's, an, yeah, right. it's a very immediate pressure. But yeah. I think some of what uh, Lord Darcy had to say about some of the preventable causes of admission, um, which are important and we need to start taking action now, if we are going to see and contain and manage demand in the longer term. So think about the number of people who turn up to A&E with a cause of admission or a problem that could be prevented, like drinking, like smoking. So some of the public health challenges, some of the issues there are profoundly important. And if we don't start acting on them now, we will continue to see the rises in A&E admissions and attendances that we've seen over the last number of years. So um, it is a problem that we need to act on both now and in the longer term. In the immediate term, to your point around the London Ambulance Services, I recognise that they are one of the most highly utilised mm. ambulance services in the country, probably the most highly utilised ambulance service in the country. Um, they have more calls and they show increasing rises for demand in their services year on year. Some of the same points apply. I work regularly with the um, ambulance service and I spend quite a lot of my time from an operational delivery perspective looking at with them how to make sure that their services are best deployed. What they tell me too is that again they have a high number of calls where their resources could be deployed more effectively elsewhere. So we do have a, a very important job 
to make sure that for those people who don't need to call an ambulance, we make them more aware of what the alternatives are and how they can access those alternatives and how um, they will get them where they want to. But people at the moment fundamentally still believe that ringing 999 is the best thing to do for every problem ranging from um, being uh, uh, something incredibly trivial to something absolutely life-threatening. You made an important point about workforce. Um, and I do think that we strategically have to address the fact that at the moment we have got to train nationally more paramedics because the evidence is not just in London but when we look at ambulance services across the country that there are insufficient supply of paramedics to manage the total ambulance demand that we have in terms of the need for paramedics and we are absolutely looking with ambulance services across the country, ambulance service commissioners, how we start addressing that. Um, and London also has its own special needs. It's a more expensive place to live here, and we need to recognise that in attracting and retaining paramedics to the London Ambulance Service, we've got to think about the unique challenges of how we get people to come and work in London. So I completely agree with all the points. We are actively engaged with the London Ambulance Service upon those very issues. Well, I'm uh, reassured to hear that, and I do accept the, um, the, the year on increases, um, but that's largely due to demographic changes. We're getting older, sure. and obviously the demands on the health service as a result are greater. In some ways, uh, this is quite, should have been predictable since 2006 where, where we Correct. were getting to. Yeah. And yes, we do need to know uh, a bit more about our, our physical needs and our physical bodies, and when is an emergency and when isn't. But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's actually... Uh, quite glaring in the, with my uh, nearest uh, A&E, which is in St Mary's, mm -hmm. and where, uh, Dr Garzi, you're, you're, you're a consultant, yep. where it's actually, uh, you know, those of us who have been involved in the consultation with the closures of A&Es in the rest of North West Health Authority, uh, we're always saying that actually um, pad, um, uh, in Paddington St Mary's, uh, we're not convinced it can cope with the additional demand. Uh, it's quite clearly been established recently. It's at maximum utilisation. Uh, and we've got two A&Es, uh, one in Hammersmith and one in Central Middlesex, closing on the 10th of September. Surely this kind of stuff should have been planned from a strategic perspective right from the outset, possibly in 2006. Uh, and they have been. And I would say further that every um, organisation in North West London, and you will know this, every medical director every CCG has supported the implementation of those changes as delivering better quality care. Um, it has to deliver all the points that people have been making around this table. So it has to deliver compelling and better primary care, so deliver out of hospital so people don't need to go to A&E. It has to deliver great A&E services when people need them. Um, but the evidence is that clinicians have led these changes, clinicians have supported them, and I think that, for me, is one of the most compelling reasons for us to get behind them, because it's, uh, it's there that I think we can make the difference. Well, well my litmus test, quietly, is that you've got one quarter before uh, the 10th of September, and it does need um, increased resources and facilities, particularly, and I'm not sure we're going to see that over the summer. So I would say that uh, colleagues in North West London are actively engaged on making sure these plans can be implemented and be implemented safely. In the next uh, quarter? Uh, sorry, say again? In, in this quarter over, over the summer? Uh, even as we speak, even now, people are making plans to make sure that the changes that are proposed on the 10th of September can go ahead and go ahead safely. And that is the litmus test. You're absolutely right. We should not proceed with changes that cannot be implemented safely. The clinicians are in the lead for making these changes happen. It is their judgment, it is they who we turn to to ask for their support in saying, is this change sufficiently strong enough to go ahead? And it, at the moment, that is what they are saying to us.